how can I uh, uh, do a lecture um, on narcissism without starting with Donald Trump? Um, but I don't know if you noticed that that wasn't just a uh, jokey uh, film, because actually they took the signs of somebody with narcissistic personality disorder and then showed Trump against them. And there is actually a deadly serious debate amongst United States uh, psychiatrists and psychologists about diagnosing the president with a clinical illness with a view to getting uh, him deposed. And the clinical illness is narcissistic personality disorder. Just to use a quote, it took a while to fully manifest, but what many social critics, notably Christopher Lash, author of The Culture of Narcissism, noticed it bubbling up from the condition of the last third of the 20th century, has fully burst into full technicolor glory in the image of America's president. In the form of Donald Trump, we have a bloated ball of um, toxic energy whose name, pasted on gaudy skyscrapers the world over, has become a byword for pathological narcissism. It's not just Trump um, that's uh, 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 diagnosed as a narcissist. It's almost a cliche these days to talk about Generation Me. And throughout the talk, this is my only multimedia note, this is me done on multimedia, but I thought that summed up the kind of Generation Me, the selfie, person on a demonstration, nothing said anti-capitalist, just like taking a selfie with an iPhone at the Hamburg G20 protest. And this picture itself has done a meme, and a lot of the, uh, the notices around it are, yes, uh, millennial uh, narcissism. Um, there's actually uh, this idea that millennials are uniquely self-obsessed, preening, uh, full of self-regard and entitlement, uh, proof is in the digital nat uh, natives with more than 80 million photographs uploaded on Instagram every day, 1.4 billion people publish personal details um, on Facebook uh, every day, and in the UK in 2017 more than a million selfies are taken each day. But all that's a bit impressionistic, and now narcissism amongst the young has become the subject of an academic uh, series of studies. One book made the headlines around the world, and unusually for an academic book, headed the bestseller chart in 2009. That is The ep uh, Narcissism Epidemic by Jean Twenge and uh, W. Keith Campbell, that analysed all the data and stats to prove the seismic shift in America's cultural norms towards self-admiration as a generational shift. And it's full of graphs and fascinating bits and pieces to back up that thesis. But before we start diagnosing the whole of a generation, or indeed even sending Trump off to a, a psychiatrist, I think we need to take a step back and look at what narcissism is and what it isn't and how it might help us uh, with our theme this weekend. The concept of narcissism emerged from the world of psychoanalysis. In 1898, Havelock Ellis, a doctor who studied human sexuality, first coined the phrase. He borrowed from Ovid's Greek myth of the beautiful young boy Narcissus, who rejected overtures of many nymphs, such as Echo, and instead fell in love with his own reflection in a forest pool. Havelock Ellis used the formulation Narcissus-like to refer to a female patient who was masturbating too much. It was never clear how much too much is too much. <laughs> Following this, in 1911, uh, the Austrian psychoanalyst an Otto Rank wrote the first psychoanalytical paper on the subject, a contribution to the study of narcissism. Rank's narcissist was a patient, a woman for whom combing her hair was such a sexual turn-on that no one else's love was ever sufficient. But Freud kind of developed that kind of quite uh, literal uh, uh, narcissist-like uh, understanding in psychoanalysis in his 1914 essay on narcissism. He expanded Rank's concept and described two kinds of narcissism. Primary narcissism, a happy state in which a baby thinks it's the centre and core of creation. And secondary narcissism, which is the problematic kind, which instead of developing a capacity to direct your libido outwards as you get older, you reinvest it in yourself and it coagulates and festers. This theory developed over 50 years and by 1968, the uh, narcissistic personality disorder was officially uh, recognised by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of uh, Mental Disorders in the US. Just to note, however, that narcissism is not an ailment as such. It is a theory of human development, and it isn't always bad to be a narcissist. Um, when babies and infants, as uh, Freud noticed, are you know, healthily uh, selfish to get their needs met, and we kind of characterise them as the lord of the high chair, that's a normal part of development, to learn to gradually, but you learn to gradually separate your viewpoint from the needs of those uh, uh, of other people. 
Of course, uh, the elements of that kind of narcissistic selfishness linger, particularly into adolescence, which is why psychiatrists don't diagnose NPD in teens. But we all eventually, gradually, shared that sense of intense self-absorption and self-centeredness. But if the process goes off the rails, when primitive or infantile self-involvement lingers or even dominates, then NPD is diagnosed for those with malignant self-regard. Now, I, I, I want to run through some features of pathology and narcissism, but it's, I'm nervous and tricky, and you saw some of them at the beginning, because it's important to note that NPD might be diagnostic, but it's not scientific. It's fuzzy and it's imprecise. But there are some salient features. Uh, typified by a core self that is overwhelmingly self-referential rather than defined by the world around them. Craves attention and desperate for the world to admire him or her, but only relates to others and society as instrumental objects. Little or no capacity for empathy. Incapable of self-reflection. Can't take criticism and sees any criticism as a personal slight and lashes out in vengeful, vengeful rage, criticised a bit like having an infant temper tantrum, and often sees himself or herself as a victim in the face of the mistreatment of others. So you can see why it's easy to diagnose Trump or Generation Snowflake as uh, uh, people with NPD. Christopher Lash, however, had a slightly different approach. In 1979, he took these diagnostic pathologies of a discrete personality types and examined how they uh, made a cultural um, uh, impact, what kind of uh, cultural feature they had on the modern world. And he actually argued that they, became, they were becoming a pervasive, uh, normal part of everyday life. In the culture of narcissism, Lash argued that aspects of clinical NPD were no longer markedly different from the personality type emerging from the culture of American society post-World War II. More broadly, Lash astutely observed that every age develops its own peculiar form of pathology, which expresses itself in an exaggerated form through the underlying structure of character or personality type of its time. So, for example, the prevalent pathology of the day can represent a heightened sense of normality. So in Freud's time, the central therapeutic problems were hysteria and obsessional neurosis, illnesses born of too much repression and an extreme sense of order. They, these were, in extremists, manifest, manifested as individual psyche and personality traits uh, that emerged in the early capitalist uh, society and bourgeois morality. So for Lash, then, he wanted to explore how the prevalent pathology of the 1970s, as in narcissistic personality disorder, were reflected in the new emerging forms of personality uh, uh, coming out and, as a reaction to radical changes in America's economic and social arrangements i.e. how social changes were associate, associated with post-war America manifested themselves at a psychological level, but in everyday life. So uh, to remind ourselves uh, of Lash's contemporary world, the book was published at the end of a period of enormous political turmoil um, that had overthrown past certainties. Um, and uh, in uh, Tim Black's brilliant tour de force that we've just heard, he kind of talked about some of these. Um, but the thing about that political turmoil was that everything that had previously been known seemed to be in flux. You had the emergence of the new left, you had student revolutionaries at home, you had anti-imperialist revolutionaries abroad, you had feminism challenging the family, you had a hedonistic counterculture challenging authority. This was the period of Vietnam War, Watergate, Nixon, uh, huge technological changes having a massive impact on work and production, uh, mass society overthrowing uh, older community ties. This was called the Great Fragmentation or the Era of Fracture. And it meant that the collapse of older arrangements um, through which individuals traditionally realised themselves, as in how they understood the self, um, and, and, and what Lash importantly noted was for the self to flourish, it actually needs social ties to allow individuals to go beyond themselves. If you remove those ties, then the individual can be left feeling abandoned and needy. And Lash says, his apparent freedom from family ties and institutional constraints does not free him to stand alone or glory in his individuality. On the contrary, it contributes to his insecurity. Lash also noted that the great fracture meant that society was stuck in a sort of treadmill of the present, had lost a sense of the historical continuity between the past and the future, 
and the, in fact the future became uh, anxiously unknowable. This impacted on the individual's sense of self. Lash says it makes sense to live only for the moment, to fix our eyes on our own private performance, to become connoisseurs of our own decadence, to cultivate transcendental self-attention. When Lash described the new personality uh, at the time, greedily grabbing at any momentary sense of personal well-being, he also identified the emergence of the therapeutic sensibility alongside narcissism that's of course so familiar to us now with the subsequent explosion of therapy culture. But he uh, it, it, it kind of gives us a nice example of this. He says, having no hope of improving their lives in any of the ways that matter, people have convinced themselves that what matters is psychic self-improvement, getting in touch with their feelings, eating healthy food, taking lessons in ballet or belly dancing, this is the 70s, immersing, <laughs> immersing themselves in the wisdom of the East, it is the 70s, uh, jogging, uh, learning how to relate. And he notes that all these activities, whilst harmless enough in themselves, when they were wrapped up in the narcissistic rhetoric of finding the real you, signified a retreat from, the political, uh, from political change and collective endeavour. It's important not to be too crude here, although I have been, um, because it's not a straightforward A causes B. Lash warns, in fact, that the concept of narcissism, quote, provides us not with a ready-made psychological determinism, but a way of understanding the impact of recent social changes. I haven't done the book credit. I know many of you will have read it, but if you haven't, uh, you should. It's brilliantly prescient. And uh, Lash's narcissist has been described as one of the greatest characters of 20th century literature, and that's true, and you'll definitely recognise him. It was a surprise bestseller. It got uh, this lefty academic, a spread in the celeb uh, People's magazine, got him an audience with President Jimmy Carter. Uh, Carter used its themes in his famous malaise or crisis of confidence speech. But the very popularity of the book, almost meme-like, has led to lots of confusions about its themes. A superficial reading has allowed both conservatives and liberals both to claim that it backs up their specific political agendas. And I just want to look at three misreadings because I think it might help us approach today's problems of the self. Those three misreadings are narcissism as a clinical term being used promiscuously to understand contemporary social trends. Narcissism uh, is, uh, and the accusation that it's the result of excessive individualism and the idea that narcissism is a code for excessive vanity or self-love. On the first point, with, in relation to the promiscuous use of the narcissism label, Lash does seem to have unleashed a torrent of articles, books and endless discussions um, using narcissism to describe all of society's ills and all done in the tone of cultural pessimism. In a recent book by Kirsten Domek, she actually criticises Lash in just these terms. Domek's The Selfishness of Others, an essay on the fear of narcissism, criticises Lash for inciting a ubiquitous discourse of cliched and lazy truisms that have ballooned into a sweeping and increasingly meaningless indictment of an entire culture. She quotes psychologist and anthropologist Michael Maccabee, who states, narcissism has become a garbage can for every kind of egocentrism and selfishness. And I think that's definitely true, and uh, it's my worry too, although I know it's not Lash's intentional fault. Domek talks about the narcosphere. This is a thriving blogosphere of pop psychology that now routinely impugns entire categories of people as narcissists. Baby boomers, millennials, reality TV stars, adulterers, everybody's ex-boss, everybody's ex. Uh, the whole t there's a whole taxonomy of every possible brand of narcissist, uh, and there is the, these are the subjects of a million quizzes like 10 ways to tell if you're involved with a narcissist and so on. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's niche forums um, uh, such as uh, www.daughtersofnarcissistmothers.com and so on and so forth. <laughs> but just let's pause here and notice something. Uh, it's a twist in the tale. Um, these days, we're all familiar with the ever-expanding definitions of mental health categories. Uh, narcissism, in that sense, is no different uh, in this, uh, from the elastic and broadened definitions of everything from uh, depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. But there is a key difference, isn't there? Because whereas more and more people use the kind of concept creep to, for example, self-diagnose themselves as uh, clinically depressed, there are not lots of people queuing up to diagnose themselves as having NPD. In fact, there are no, um, in fact, 
What these expanded definitions are doing is they're used to diagnose everybody else. <laughs> it's interesting to note that um, this is one pathological disorder that it's okay to stigmatise. A mental health category where people unapologetically use it as an insult. It's moralised negatively. You call someone a narcissist, it is a derogatory phrase. So the shift of gaze of narcissism has moved post-Lash. Counselors report that they know that narcissism is on the rise. Why? Because more and more people are seeking therapy for the trauma that's been caused by having a narcissistic <laughs> boss or a narcissistic partner. There are narcissism survivors groups and you can get PTSD from living with a narcissist. Right. The danger then is that the narcosphere, which claims Lash as its mentor, has created a new model personality type of psychologically needy, fragile victims with a heightened sense of grievances, hard done at the hands of others, or, um, um, but with a new villain, and that new villain and cul culprit, blown, blamed for all their woes, is narcissism. The second misreading of Lash, uh, very quickly, is that the culture of narcissism is a critique of robo robust uh, individualism. And this idea that narcissism and individualism are interchangeable is particularly enthusiastically embraced by leftist commentators. David Brooks, in his book The Road to Character, cites Lash to make that point, as did the earlier Oliver James' Selfish Capitalism. They cite Lash to show that neoliberal capitalism has unleashed a rampant and problematic individualism that is narcissistically self-centred um, as a society of greedy consumers. But actually, Lash was not attacking individualism at all. Rather, his is a critique of how late capitalism diminished individualism into a hologram. It robbed individualism of independent agency, because the only way of realising one's grandiose ambitions to be great was a dependence on the uh, attention of others. Lash says that for the narcissist, the world is a mirror, whereas for the rugged individualist or ideal type, the world is an empty wilderness to be shaped uh, by his own design. The third misunderstanding of Lash's idea of narcissism is that it's all about self-love. Reading about uh, Lash and narcissism for this lecture, there's been so many endless uh, references to Carly Simon's You're So Vain that I just kind of, one of my favourite songs, but I went off it. Um, but anyway, Lash <laughs> explained over and over again that narcissists, ironically, have very little ego. They lack confidence in their own judgement. They have a weak sense of self because they constantly need to be admired to bolster themselves. This is an insubstantial personality with no depth. And to quickly remind ourselves in relation to self-love of the original myth, when Narcissus fixated in, um, on that floating image in the pond, he doesn't recognise the image. He doesn't fall in, self, in love with himself. He falls in love with a beautiful creature that he doesn't know is him. He mistakes it for another separate being. When he tries to embrace his loved one, uh, and puts his uh, hands in the water, of course the image disappears into ripples. In this sense, Narcissus uh, doesn't know himself well enough even to recognise this mirror image, and his love is illusionary, and the self he loves is unsubstantial and unobtainable. But beyond Greek uh, myths, if you actually read the literature from therapists who work with narcissists, they report that they, as narcissists, when they're kind of understanding their condition, talk about feeling like as though they've got a withered inner life, that their interiority is completely vacated. So there's a kind of self-knowledge uh, when they're recovering, as it were. Malignant self-love, then, as it's known, um, actually is all about a sense of emptiness. And that drives narcissists to hunger for authentic emotional in, uh, experiences to fill in the inner void. And it drives them to compensate by creating an external false self full of confidence, but dependence on others' admiration and recognition to prop it up. And I think that some of those latter points are important for us in contemporary society, because I think they are the features that actually linger into 2017. And um, so I want to now look at some prevalent uh, parts of today's personality type and do a quick survey of where I think narcissism is today. But it's very superficial, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll just give it a go. I think that, um, I'm going to be generous, I actually think that young people today are not satisfied with the model of self and personality available to them, and they know that that kind of hollowed out, meaning light version of the self is pretty grim, right? Nobody wants to kind of aspire to that. You'd rather be the rugged individual. So they yearn for a more substantial, rooted, anchored sense of self. However, 
despite the fact that I think this is a positive uh, drive, which is good, um, to make more of themselves, to do something with their lives, to pursue what Joel Taylor calls the ideal of authenticity, uh, despite its ambivalence, their efforts often take an alienated, warped and deviant form because they're hemmed in by narcissistic tendencies. This new quest for the authentic self is rarely focused on enriching the interior life. People do not think, I want to really enrich the self, I'll go to the academy. Do you know what I mean? They don't do that. Right? They, they, instead, they take on the kind of exterior form of public performance. For example, the quest to make more of yourself often involves the conscious construction of a new you and regularly involves a focus on the body. And in some ways, the body has replaced the soul, the heart, the mind as a site for moral enhancement of the self. There's a fascinating piece of work from uh, Joan Jacob uh, Broomberg, an American social historian, called The Body Project uh, from the 90s. Anyway, she writes an account of the changing sense of self over a century by comparing the diaries of adolescent American girls. In 1892, there's a diary which is full of the moral language of improving the diary's own character. So, to quote one of them, I resolved not to talk about myself or my feelings, to think before speaking, to work seriously, to be self-restrained in conversation and action, not to let my thoughts wander, to be dignified, to interest myself in others. Oh, I want to meet that girl. But the point is, you'd never meet her, because she doesn't exist now, does she? To interest myself in her, this bloody hell. Um, it's charming, it's quaint, it feels very dated, right? Then we move on to 1890, uh, sorry, 18, 1982 diary entry, uh, a teenager of the same age in the same area. I will try and make myself better in any way I can. Good, good, pass. Good start. But then this self-betterment project goes on. I will try and make myself better in any way I can. I will lose weight, get new lenses, have a new haircut, buy new makeup, clothes and accessories. We all recognise that. We've all done it. Uh, the focus on making herself better is by focusing on the externals, specifically on adorning the body. But actually, that sounds very old-fashioned, doesn't it? You can tell that's the 1980s and not now. That was 35 years ago. These days, the construction of the self is far more drastic and visceral than getting new lenses or dieting. So, for example, plastic surgery and body modification has gone through the roof since the 1990s. Breast augmentation, liposuction, fillers, Botox are apparently now more common than therapy. There's been a 13% rise in procedures in the UK in, in uh, last year, and also it's happening ever younger. There's a new panicky report by the Nuffield Council of Bioethics uh, that uh, cosmetic surgery apps are being targeted at eight-year-olds. Um, and never mind the fact that teenagers in my day used to worry about wearing braces, now there's an explosion in cosmetic dentistry amongst under-18-year-olds uh, because they don't like their teeth in selfies. Um, this is, of course, not about finding the real self, but it's so often about appropriating somebody else's self, somebody else's body at least, uh, to become the new self. You want to have a Barbie figure or Ka Kim Kardashian's bottom or whatever. It's also not about self-love. It's driven by dissatisfaction with one's own body, with one's nose, with one's breast. There's a list of flaws and blemishes and imperfections. And in fact, psychoanalysts who are actually advocates of, uh, of body uh, changing actually suggest that surgery or a nip and a tuck can address body confidence issues, but then admit that they're rarely successful because patients go back for more and more and more work. They still don't ever feel at home or happy with their bodies. Now, of course, I know, and especially in this audience with cosmetic surgery, it's all a bit of a tut-tut disapproval. You know, it's all a bit towy, boob jobs, a little bit class snobbery there. You know what I mean? And certainly feminists don't <laughs> agree. You know, it's all a bit like we were. <laughs> you know. But I think that there is a middle-class mirror to that, and I think arguably the explosion in the numbers of teenagers registering for gender reassignment clinics and the fashion for transgenderism, which is also obviously a focus on the body as a site of change, is much similar. It's also about appropriating another body to become your true self. The focus of the real me means actually doing drastic violence to your own physical being. Um, it's actually, you know, in some instances, the amputation of genitalia. Josie Appleton, in her excellent blog post on this, notes how transgender, in terms of the trans 
gender phenomena, uh, the true self takes a form that is entirely physical and quotes a number of transsexuals who say, I want to look like what I am. I must transform the body I have so it fits as closely as possible to my image of myself. So the body is the real you as manifested. The person you are is not a matter of spirit or vocation or actions or choices in the world. It's instead reduced to altering the physical form. Your true self is another body. Of course, there's a really dark side to this new search for self via a focus on the literal self of the body, as illustrated by recent developments in the exponentially growing modern pathology and clinically noted as borderline personality disorder, and I think personality disorder is very appropriate here, and that is self-harm. Self-harm involves a range of deliberative behaviours including cutting, burning, bruising by hitting objects, ingesting dangerous uh, substances, inserting objects into the skin, reopening wounds, and various other things. At the end of last year, the NSPCC report, using data obtained by Freedom of Information, discovered 18,778 11 to 18-year-olds were admitted to hospital for self-harm between 2015 to 16. Now, I'm normally wary of NSPCC-generated panics, but those figures are in fact true, and they do not even speak to half of it, because every indication outside of hospital admissions is that this problem is wide-scale and growing. A recent Times Educational Supplement uh, published a survey of 1,100 school leavers that indicated that incidents of self-harm have risen to half of all schools, including primary. Um, And you have to recognise that this did exist uh, five years ago, but was largely confined to girls' (laughs) private schools. Now it's all of them. And if you talk to any teacher, they'll tell you there's at least one cutter in every class. It's an interesting shift as well to note in relation to self-harm that despite the visible physicality of the acts like wounds and cuts and blood and gore and all that, actually, historically, self-harm has been a secret and clandestine activity. And self-harm has went to great lengths to wear long sleeve tops and polar necks and to cover themselves up. But unfortunately, there's been a new turn and it's become a performance on social media. So there is a new craze for live streaming self-harm, such that Facebook have now got a new macabre policy uh, which says we are now seeing more video content, including suicides, shared on Facebook of self-harm. We don't want to censor or punish people in distress who are attempting suicide or self-harm. Why not? Uh, Experts have told us what's best for these people's safety is to let them live stream as long as they are engaging viewers. I know, I couldn't do that. (laughs) Tumblr also has a new policy against the promotion and glorification of self-harm, which they say is far more problematic than the glorification um, of terrorism. Doctors are expressing alarm amongst the pro-anorexia groups and anorexia is another self-harm, different body, blah, blah, uh, that, that, that there's a growth of pro-anorexia groups, chat rooms, discussion boards, and so on. And they worry that the new psychosocial pathologies are taking an, an unhealthy form of kind of going public. Dr. Stan Kutchner, an adolescent psychiatric as, expert, makes the point that many of these body-related psychological illnesses used to be uh, clandestine. It was hard to get sufferers to open up and talk. They suffered in silence. And now, he says, we, everybody is blaming about them and we can't get them to be quiet. So it's like a kind of parade um, of their illnesses uh, in a very melodramatic manner is now the kind of new uh, side of this. One uh, aspect of these um, public for- sorry, one aspect of this is the emergence of public forums and support groups. But the thing that's really uh, distressing about them is um, I, the, the kind of discussions that they have are things like, "Don't hide your scars; it's part of the real you." Um, and you know, obviously, I, I want to say here, I'm not objecting to communities of interest or online communities. In fact. <laughs> You could say that in some ways this is an attempt to go beyond yourself, your empty self, and kind of form new forms of solidarity, and I get all that. And I think that's kind of reasonable. Um, But, you know, the problem with these safe spaces for self-harmers is that in order to be accepted into the group, you need to advertise or illustrate your suffering, literally show your scars. And I think you can uh, see how this behaviour in the psychosocial realm has a mirror image in the world of politics and culture. 
Um, the whole discourse around intersectionality and who gets, for example, to join a different identity uh, community or different group involves making a public display of one's emotional, if not one's physical wounds, of making visible one's pain as a victim of the world. And I think this feels like a broader trend in terms of how the project of the self has taken a particularly glaringly narcissistic performative turn. Uh, Christine uh, Rose makes the point that uh, um, American uh, uh, public intellectual makes the point that Delphic's oracle was know thyself and now the motto is show thyself. Um, Lash famously wrote, before selfies had been ever thought of or live streaming, uh, we cannot help responding to others as if their actions and our own were being recorded and simultaneously transmitted for an unseen audience. The thing is now you are recording and you are showing them to that audience. And I think we behave in that way uh, as though all our social relations and political engagement is recorded. We now politicise selfies, you know, I was here, I was centre of the action, I'm going to show you is uh, uh, the kind of thing we get there. We also have virtue signalling, making a performance of our own piety. Um, there's no need to actually do anything virtuous, by the way. Uh, don't, don't worry about taking in a refugee family into your home. Just tweet that you hate Katie Hopkins, and that will kind of draw attention to the fact that you love refugees and so on. This all means, I think, that the contemporary political personality is marked by a sort of shallow, superficial, ersatz flimsiness. Um, and then there's a kind of desperate scramble to add more authenticity, because people kind of know it's kind of insubstantial. Um, but again, the answer is never to develop a richer interior life or read more books or debate or anything. Instead, it's to appropriate other people's experience and suffering and even bodies uh, to bolster the victim's selfhood. I was fascinated by the story of Rachel Donzel, the American white activist, who effectively blacked up to pass, on, um, pass herself on as a, a woman of colour. And her uh, uh, defence was, I identify as black. But the thing was, was that in order to be an <coughs> activist, an anti-racist activist, she appropriated the black physical persona uh, to express her true anti-racist self. It might be a bit extreme, but I think this trend of appropriating the self from external sources to make more of yourself is a trend in the context of identity politics that trades on victimhood and suffering um, to prove authenticity. You know, look at the attitude to the past and history. There's a tendency to plunder the suffering of earlier generations to find some hurt and added grievance that might uh, add to your claim uh, to, to uh, for your own claims today. So the Rhodes Must Fall controversy, Oxford University, Cecil Rhodes, pull the statue down uh, issue. There you had highly privileged um, BME students at one of the best universities in the world who, in order to really kind of put themselves centre and bolster their sense of self, appropriated the suffering of slaves into their contemporary personal stories. One quote was, the festering, rotting wound that the statue Cecil Rhodes represents is the ideology of white supremacy, and it continues to do damage to our black and brown bodies. <laughs> and it, the emphasis on bodies, the fact that it talks about the festering, rotting wound and all that sort of thing, is maybe uh, just touch, touches on what I'm saying. But these artificial declarations of suffering and performative reconstructions of, of the victim self really do have a fake uh, quality about them. It's a kind of forgery of self. It looks like the real thing, but it never goes beyond the surface. And it's this surface quality and a sense of it, and I think people have a sense of its own inauthenticity that can lead to the kind of quite brittle defences of identities that we now see when um, uh, cultural identities are walled off not only from criticism uh, in safe spaces, but guarded against in disputes in relation to cultural appropriation. It's ironic, it seems to me, that many who have appropriated other bodies or experiences are always trying to externally grab things to add to themselves, to bolster their own self, declare rigid boundaries around symbols of cultural identities. And I think, again, it tells us something of the superficiality of today, that some of the most passionate uh, um, um, policing um, of, of the kind of cultural identities uh, centres on the most trivial physical manifestations of identity in terms of clothes and hairstyle. 
It has now become a ritual that supermodels and pop stars are castigated for, you know, for example, dressing up as geisha. Uh, they're accused of yellow face. But, you know, is that a, 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 an indication that we think that the Japanese self is reducible to black wigs and white face makeup? Or are, are those uh, drinking tequila while wearing sombreros really stealing a core part of the Mexican self-identity? Because that's the implication that that's somehow there. Katy Perry who you can always rely on to capture the regressive trends of any day, has recently commented on the outrage of the trendy new uh, growth of braid bars, uh, hair salons, um, and she combined this kind of like saying that that was cultural appropriation of black culture, she combined that with a mea culpa for her own crime of wearing cornrows. She apologised to the BME community because she said that she realised she was guilty when a politically woke friend, I didn't know what it meant, but I do know. Well, anyway, when a politically woke friend explained the power in black women's hair, <laughs> I think that somehow sums up the kind of political narcissistic degeneration when black power gets reduced to hair power. How long have they got? Three minutes, five minutes? Anyway, good. <laughs> We've got time for the end, which I'm is thought was optional. Maybe. Bloody hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, right, just, okay. Um, okay, I, maybe I want to I maybe finish off um, with, with some thoughts on recognition. I'm just skipping out a bit, but I think that there's something about this kind of performance, but I think that people know it's nonsense. That's what I'm trying to say. But that makes the demands for recognition all the more shrill and harsh and you've got to tell me you know you've got to tell me my authentic and real and all that but anyway some thoughts on recognition i think possibly i've read too many 19th century novels but anyway uh, genuine self-worth often goes unnoticed historically uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact in george Eliot's famous finale to middlemarch on the way that dorothea uh, lives her life um, we get this uh, reflection The growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts so that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully hidden lives and rested in unvisited tombs. Look, I understand saying to today's generation you should aspire to living hidden lives uh, and ending up in unvisited graves is unlikely to inspire much activity. (laughs) Nobody wants to actually go uh, unnoticed in life or be invisible, but I think there's something heroic and admirable about them doing the right thing uh, because they were doing the right thing, right? Not because they thought they didn't get in a novel, right? Um, But the admiration for achievements or something that transcends self Um, actually is eminently more satisfying than the demand for affirmation just for being you. And actually, it was a few years ago, David McCullough Jr. gave a 12-minute commencement speech to the Wellesley High uh, School graduates, known as the You Are Not Special film, which has actually gone viral and been viewed two million times. And he ended his speech with, climb the mountain so you can see the world, not so the world can see you. And I agree. He was, of course, referring to the story of uh, why uh, there's no photo of Edmund Hillary when he was the first man to reach the top of Everest. But there is a photo of Sherpa Tenzing. Uh, Isaac's held aloft, you know, flag fluttering and so on. And Tenzing said that he offered to take Hillary's photo, but Hillary declined. Instead, he started taking pictures of the surrounding mountains and planning possible routes uh, up at the peaks. Now, that is just unimaginable today. And it's not that long ago, right, that someone achieving something so momentous would shrug off the chance to immortalise their central role. But, of course, what immortalises Hillary is that he did it, the achievement, not that we haven't got the photo. The problem when seeking admiration for the self minus achievement, it means that you're asking for recognition directly from me. And that's very exposing. Because the more people bind up their entire existence with their constructed identity, the more people experience criticism or even failure to admire as a mortal existential threat. And hence, I think, they retreat into the hall of mirrors, the echo chambers and the safe spaces. So this is my final thought. Mark Leela, professor of humanities, writing in the New York Times in the wake of Trump's election, wrote a very fine article entitled The End of Identity Liberalism, which I recommend you read. But he said, we have produced a generation of liberals and progressives 
narcissistically unaware of the conditions outside their self-defined groups and indifferent to the task of reaching out to Americans in every walk of life. At a very young age, our children are being encouraged to talk about their individual identities even before they have them. And I think that's a very good updating of Lash's narcissistic uh, thesis, and maybe we should think about this um, when we look at the focus on identity politics that lurks in, in, in every uh, cocoon, self-referential, safe space, um, surrounded by the usual set of what the narcissists would have um, uh, sycophants and courtiers, but we just have kind of just people who agree with us and ban anyone else. Maybe actually narcissist isn't our problem. Maybe he's not the person that we should take um, from the Ovid myth. Maybe the problem in the Ovid myth is, the, uh, is, is, is uh, summed up by the unrequited love echo. Uh, she who uh, really does provide us with new uh, challenges. Because I think it's the sealed off echo chambers um, that actually are really destroying uh, the self in contemporary society. Okay.